Yoga helps us to gain control of our lives. This is complicated by the fact that we have a false and prejudiced view of the world and two minds, a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. We ordinarily think of ourselves as having chosen to do something, but while we may consciously decide to do something, it is always the subconscious which actually does it. Even such a simple thing as opening a door is an incredibly complicated activity which the most advanced robots of the current era struggle mightily with. In the human body, this requires the coordination of hundreds of muscles, keeping the body balanced and upright, the flow of blood, the metabolism, and the operation of trillions of cells, and moreover, it is done so well. We're not even consciously aware of it most of the time. The great power of the conscious mind is that it's creative. It's entirely capable of originating things and developing new and better ways of doing things. Its limitation is that it's simply too slow to deal with many of the complex challenges we face daily. Instead, our subconscious, which can perform a million calculations while we are doing one, uses programs, habits, and reflexes, which are executed automatically with blazing speed and little or no conscious awareness on our part. The subconscious basically takes instructions from your conscious mind and executes them. And this effectively results in it building your thoughts into your body and your life. Everything we do and say, everything which happens to us affects and changes our bodies and minds in some way. With repetition, our thoughts become habits. And in a very real sense, we are the sum of our habits. The importance of this must not be underestimated. A habit is executed automatically. We do not even think about it. And consequently, habits can come to supplant our free will. They can become a conclusion, a belief, or an answer before a question has even been asked. In fact, most people are not conscious at all about 95% of the time. They're simply recycling the same thought patterns and behaviors over and over again without realizing it. So the big question becomes, do we actually want the habits we created? Are we making real decisions? Or are they all being determined by subconscious programs we don't even remember? To understand this situation, we must go back to our beginning. The newborn child does not have the consciousness that you have. Until the age of about two, the child's brain waves are mostly in the range of zero to five hertz, or what are called delta waves. If you were in that state, you'd be asleep, but the child is not nor is it conscious in the sense that you are either. It has few memories, it has little or no knowledge, and consequently no context for reflection in the sense that you would think of it yet. From the age of about two to six, the child's brain waves move mostly into the range of theta waves, which run from about four to eight hertz. If you were in that state, you'd be in a hypnotic trance, but the child is in a realm between imagination and reality and a condition of super learning. At this age, a child can learn three languages at the same time. This works because the child's two brain lobes are synchronized and they're in a condition which enables them to virtually download everything directly into their minds. 
Unfortunately, the child has no ability to validate the information and programs being downloaded into them. We might hope that this could be repaired later, but by the time a child is six years old, its personality and the manner in which it engages the world have already been largely fixed, and the adult will be disinclined to change if they think about it at all. Moreover, additional programs will be added over the years both by us and by others without our ever realizing it. Your subconscious is fast and persistent, but your conscious mind is extremely powerful too. Contrary to what you've always been told, it can even control your involuntary body functions such as heartbeat. However, it can only control one of them at a time because our objective consciousness can only focus on one thing at a time. Nevertheless, it's a great power and one which may be used to change things we have all been taught were unchangeable, not only in the mind, but in your body. Since early childhood, most of us have been taught that our genes determine who we are and what we must become, and that the traits we express were the luck of the genetic draw. However, more recent science has demonstrated that this point of view has been greatly overstated. Genes are a blueprint for making proteins, but they're not self-actuating. The genes are activated by epigenetic switches, which are controlled by the environment the organism finds itself in, and this includes your mental world. Consequently, two individuals having the exact same genes may not develop the same diseases or problems at all. Additionally, all of our tissues are regenerated throughout our lives by our own stem cells. Each day, billions of our cells die and must be replaced. And we have within ourselves the innate ability to regenerate and repair damaged organs such as our heart and brain cells. Even when you are badly hurt or have made bad lifestyle choices, you can still recover. In the 1960s, experiments were done by Dr. Bruce Lipton, a tenured professor at the University of Wisconsin, which demonstrated this fact conclusively. Dr. Lipton, who was instructing medical doctors at the time, took cloned stem cells and divided them into three groups. Depending upon the environment they were placed in, they produced either bone or muscle or fat cells. And since the cells were genetically identical, it became clear that it was the environment which was determining the outcome. Genes are not self-actuating. They're covered by a protein sheath which must be removed in order for them to be read and the information in them used. It is the epigenetic switches which do this, and as it turns out, one gene sequence can produce over 30,000 different proteins depending on the environment the gene finds itself in. Nor should it be supposed that this process is entirely chemical in nature either. Modern medicine is almost entirely stuck in the realm of Newtonian physics, which assumed that the universe was basically a physical machine. Its response to everything is a chemical pill or surgery. However, the advent of relativity and quantum mechanics has clearly demonstrated that the universe is not just a physical machine. And in this context, it's the energy field which determines the fate of the particle. Likewise, humans are profoundly affected 
by the energy fields and the thoughts which surround them, and some scientists now believe that the energy fields are a hundred times more powerful than simple chemistry. In fact, we're exposed to both chemical and energy fields from the beginning in the womb of our mothers. This was nature's way of giving the fetus a head start at dealing with the environment it was going to be born into. Would it face conditions of plenty or would food be scarce? Would the environment be supportive or was it going to be violent? These conditions require very different kinds of bodies, different mentalities, and the necessary information is passed directly from the mother to the fetus, which responds accordingly. Many experts believe that not only are all of our physical traits determined at this point, but that about half of our personalities are fixed before we're even born. However, this does not mean that things have to stay that way. Environments change and we're profoundly affected by the thought and energy fields which surround us, including not only our own thoughts, but those of the company we keep and the traditions and religions we embrace. The ancient yogis always knew that our thoughts were things and that they would ultimately be built into us. In yoga, samskaras and vasanas are our thoughts and actions and the grooves they leave in our minds. We each carry subconscious programs built into us by our parents, our society, and some that we've added ourselves. Many of these are very useful, but if we're using our parents' programs in a world greatly changed since they were young, there's going to be trouble. This programming can be changed, but you have to know how. Your subconscious acts like a machine, so it does not reason in the way that you do consciously, and trying to deal with it as if it were another person is not likely to succeed. There are several ways to go about reinventing ourselves, but much success in breaking bad programming has been had in recent years using methods such as EFT or emotional freedom therapy. These methods are described extensively in such books as Instant Emotional Healing and the many videos available on EFT on YouTube.com. These techniques involve what is called polarity balancing and tapping the body's energy medians at various acupuncture or marma points in conjunction with repeating certain affirmative statements and using an even-if statement admitting to our doubts. EFT sounds silly to most people because they do not understand their body's energy system. However, it has been demonstrated to be extremely effective, as testified to by medical doctors, in treating pain and other maladies which have plagued their patients for years. And moreover, it often does this in a few minutes and has successfully treated conditions that have defied surgery and drugs. The success is often attributed to the placebo effect, but an investigation of that phenomena is very revealing. Many medical authorities now admit that at least 33% of all healings are due to the placebo effect, and many think it may be as high as 66%. This has just not gotten the attention it should have, because there is no money in pursuing that line of research. However, it does not take much imagination to figure out what's going on, and the reason for it has always been embedded in the deeper teachings of yoga. 
the placebo effect is a manifestation of the body's innate ability to heal itself, and it is profoundly related to and affected by the individual's belief system, and more specifically, it has to do with the energy fields that person is immersed in and attuned with. Or, as Swami Rama has said, all of the body may be in the mind, but not all of the mind is in the body. You're not your body. Your consciousness is using it as a vehicle to manifest in this world and dimension. So it makes sense to learn how to operate it, and this is one of the primary functions of yoga. At this time, most illnesses like heart disease and cancer have been proven to have their roots in bad lifestyle choices. This includes diet, exercise, and where you're keeping your mind. There are unfortunately many special interest groups in this world determined to keep your mind filled with false ideas and your body saturated with toxic foods. You cannot ingest poison and expect to flourish. Unfortunately, there is no shortage of bad advice concerning what we should be eating, and this is complicated by the fact that we have different body types, are of different ages, and living in different situations. However, the diet which would seem to make the most sense is the one we ate as hunter-gatherers in prehistory. That is the diet which was tested for evolution for millions of years. If it wasn't found in the ancient forest, you probably shouldn't be eating it. And you may be sure it did not consist of Twinkies, 24 ounces, pizza, wheat, bread, including whole grain, and corn, and the junk foods most people are scarfing down today. Also, the false thoughts and the negative programs people are ingesting today are deadly as well. Nevertheless, you can break this cycle and also reach into that part of your mind which is not in the body and attune with a higher energy field. Within you is the means of reaching beyond time and space and embracing a great power you never learned about in school. In the words of Thomas Paine, we have it within our power to begin the world over again. Namaste.